It's nice, Morgan, that you gave us that word, unforgettable, because now it just accumulates and expands. Um, and we can carry that forward in our unforgettable consciousness. Um, next up is Laylee Long Soldier. <laughs> Laylee Long Soldier is a poet architect in the arena of witness and longing. Her poems have appeared in The American Poet, The American Reader, The Kenyan Review Online, and other publications. She is the recipient of the 2015 NACF National Artist Fellowship, a 2015 Lannan Literary Fellowship, and a 2016 Whiting Award. Her work of poetry, Whereas, will be published by Grey Wolf Press in 2017. Laylee Long Soldier resides in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Laylee Long Soldier. Hi. <laughs> I felt so nervous. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. I'm Petu Ashte, Leili Akichita Honska Imachiapi, Daya Hippi Nachante Washte, Nabe Chiyuzapi. I just said in our language, Lakota language, it's nice to be here with you. I come with a good heart. Um, this feels so awkward. Just a second. First of all, thank you, Zoe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Zoe, for the invitation to be here. My name, as I said, is Laylee Long Soldier, and I do reside in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I am a citizen of the United States, but I am also an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, which means that I am a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation, um, which is located on land that is also referred to as the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Right now, our people, <laughs> excuse me. Right now, our people the Lakota, Dakota people, Ochete Shakoween people are in a state of crisis. Our relatives in Standing Rock, North Dakota. are doing everything they can to protect their homeland and water from the damaging construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Some of you may have heard about that. I'm sorry, I got, didn't expect to get so emotional. They are fighting to protect <clears throat> the, their home from the desecration of sacred sites and burial grounds, from toxic destruction. They are fighting for the home of their grandchildren in generations to come. A home that has been theirs and ours for thousands of years. In the past few days, they have suffered the assault of concussion bombs, rubber bullets, mace, 
tasing, billy clubs, and incarceration in their attempts to protect. So I admit that this is all I can think about right now. For this reason, I wanted to read something that is not my voice alone. I come here to the share the voices of our people. Um, just a note, I'll, I'll read something in a minute, but it's a collection, it's sort of a collage piece of um, many posts and many things written and uh, videos from our community. Responding to Zoe's piece was difficult to even attempt to articulate what kind of U.S. president I'd like. I feel in my, in my stomach something blooms. The largest petals and nectar heart of a great vacuous and ever-present silence. It happens every time and any time I think of a U.S. president. It happens because of a great vacuous and ever-present divide at the threshold of the concerns and motivations and interests of an American president. Is this American democracy, this American capitalism, this great American dream? All of it is this divide, a wall between me, my family, us as Native people. For example, in 2009, our current president spoke before a National Congress of Native Leaders. He said, <clears throat> brothers and sisters here, I pledge to all of you, I'd be a partner with all of you in the spirit of a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship. He said, I hope I've done right by you. We know the history that we share. It's a history marked by violence and treaties were violated, promises were broken, when Washington thought it knew what was best for you. That is a history that we've got to acknowledge before we move forward. That is why I want you to know that I'm absolutely committed to moving forward with you, he said, and forging you, with you a new and better future. It's a commitment to getting this relationship right so that you can be full partners in the American economy, so your children and grandchildren can have an equal shot at pursuing the American dream. He addressed us as brothers and sisters, but a few days ago, as violence escalated in Standing Rock and pipeline construction, has come within 0.25 miles, one quarter mile of the Missouri River, our U.S. president said he will wait a few weeks and allow this to play out. I have asked myself what brother and sister means to him. And I have asked myself what it means to me. I have wondered, could
Could I ever have a U.S. president whose brother explains, and now I'll share the voices of our community, whose brother explains, we are trying to protect land that was taken from us, and now we're being seen as trespassers on our own land. Our people are tired and sick. Our people are done with sacrificing self-determination. It's infuriating to look at hills that have our ancestors buried there, sacred ground, burial mounds, carrying our grandparents. And we're told that we can't walk there we can't pray there. We can't put our bodies on the line to protect it. That pain runs deep. Could I have a president whose brother looks straight through, whose brother holds still, whose brother knows enough is enough? Will we ever elect a president whose nieces, nephews, and grandchildren have run on foot nearly 2,000 miles. From Standing Rock to Washington, D.C. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. To deliver a petition with 140,000 signatures, a president whose 16 year old daughter says, I'm running to send a message that our Lakota verse voices need to be heard. The world needs to know we are here. They did not take us out. We are still here. Whose niece runs each stride with the voice of her family. Could we ever have a US president whose cousin stands at the front line who describes the moment saying, they started moving in. Excuse me. And I said, you're going to arrest us now, right? You're going to make criminals out of us now, right? We wanted to hold the line, but they started shooting. They sprayed everybody in the face, and it went in my mouth. I couldn't breathe. Concussion grenades went off. I just covered my ears and dropped down. I had a feather in my hand and I put my hands up. I just stayed there and I prayed the whole time. If we poison the water, we poison ourselves. Could we have a president with a cousin whose dimples pierce each side of her cheeks, deep in a smile, she braves in that crying. Could we possibly elect a president whose brother-in-law is a Diné chef who volunteered to cook in Standing Rock? who arrived at the camp and said, when I stepped into the pantry in the tent, all I saw was a stack of flour, ceiling high, nothing but canned goods, processed foods. As a native chef, it brought back this ancestral memory of survival food when our ancestors were put on internment camps on reservations, given government rations, 
commodities like lard, flour, sugar, and there were no natural resources or natural food to be found. A president whose brother-in-law cooks up a pot of bison and blue hominy stew, whose brother remembers ancestral flavors, the taste of his people. Could we ever have a president whose mother travels to Standing Rock? and participates in a ceremony to burn the doctrine of discovery among clergy and tribal leaders, whose mother stands at the mic to say, I am a survivor of boarding schools. I was part of boarding schools for nine years. I have intergenerational trauma I'm trying to heal from. I was silent for 50 years, and I did not even talk about it with my family, whose mother's voice shakes as it rises, whose mother could not say it otherwise. Will we ever elect a president whose cousin grew up on Standing Rock, who posts updates online daily, who says, when I talk about Standing Rock and the Dakota Access Pipeline, people often ask me, why do you bring up so many other issues? Boarding schools, broken treaties, missing and murdered indigenous women. It's because they're all connected, she says. They're interdependent. Could we have a president whose cousin can see the wide stretch of land, the hill, a mountain, burial site, river, the past and present, whose cousin sees the connections between? Could I have a president whose family is accused of holding on to and living in the past, sneered at and asked to let go? I will see a president elected who considers Native people as his or her relatives, who considers this land not just a stretch of resources, but regards this land as his or her mother. But I wonder if I will ever in my lifetime see a president who understands hair as being connected to knowledge. That knowledge is connected to water a river. I wonder if in my lifetime I will ever see a president with hair down to the waist. Thank you.